Luke chapter 20, look at uh, verse 23 there. In Luke chapter 20, verse 23, the Bible says, But he perceived their craftiness and said unto them, Why tempt ye me? The title of the sermon this morning is, He perceived their craftiness. He perceived their craftiness. Now, uh, chapter 20, Luke chapter 20 starts a new, sort of a new chapter in this book, if you will. The first three chapters of the book of Luke were prior to the, the ministry of Jesus Christ. We, we learn about John the Baptist and we learn about the birth of Christ and, and Christ comes to be baptized of John the Baptist. And then from chapters 4 to 19, we have the three-year ministry, the, the bulk of Jesus Christ's three-year ministry as he's going from city to city, town to town, preaching the gospel, healing the sick, casting out devils. Uh, but if you remember last week in, our la- in chapter 19, we saw Jesus coming uh, to uh, the final time into Jerusalem, riding on that donkey, uh, being praised as the king of Israel by his disciples, and then he comes in, he cleanses the temple that one more time. So now from, from chapters 20 to the end of Luke, we really have this final week. It, it's all one week, and it's all crammed into these last uh, chapters here of the Bible. And the book of Luke doesn't cover too much about uh, the events following the resurrection of Christ. We see the resurrection, but then I think in the last chapter, it just basically you know, descends up to heaven. We don't see so much more about uh, what took place afterwards. But uh, yeah, so I just want to get to that, that picture here, that uh, ch- uh, Luke chapter 20 to the end of Luke is one week, like seven days pretty much, and, and the resurrection, so three days later as well. Uh, so let's pick it up from verse number one. It says, And it came to pass that on one of those days, as he taught the people in the temple. So here we have Jesus, not only did he cleanse the temple, but there's another day now, maybe the second day of the week, where he's, he's uh, teaching in the temple. People are coming in and hearing him preach. And he says, and he preached the gospel. He preached the gospel. You see, that was the main thing that Jesus came, uh, came to preach. The chief priests and the scribes came upon him with the elders and spake unto him, saying, Tell us, by what authority doest thou these things? Or who is he that gave thee this authority? So we as his believers, we as people that believe the Bible, we know where the authority of Jesus is coming from. We know that it's coming from God the Father. We know that he's descended from heaven. He was born of Mary, that he's God in the flesh. But they're asking the question, what what was it? The, 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 The elders, the scribes, the chief priests. You know, the religious leaders once again come. They don't like the fact that Jesus is teaching the gospel. They don't like that he's teaching the common man. But you know, the people that are here in the temple, you need to understand, these are people that have a heart for God. These are people that, that want to serve Him. They want to be right with Him. They come and bring their sacrifices to the temple. They come and pray in the temple. You know, whatever it is, singing praises. These are people that are seeking God, right? These aren't your sort of your other Jews that just have no time for God in the temple. And so he's, Jesus is teaching those that uh, truly have a heart for God and, the, and the, the religious leaders don't like this at all. Now, before we, before Jesus answer, before we look at Jesus answer this question, you know, the title of this sermon is, He Perceived Their Craftiness. What you'll see in this chapter is that uh, people are, are, are asking Jesus questions again and again and again in order to find fault in Him, okay? They're not people that are truly seeking an answer. They're just trying to um, put Jesus in a bad light. And we need to be aware of this, brethren, that not everybody that comes asking you a question or comes asking me a question does it from a pure heart, okay? They're, quite often they come in with, with craftiness. They come in to hurt you or hurt me. And I, I've told you this before, but when I first started this church, I mean, I got the weirdest phone calls. I mean, I still get the weirdo call me from time to time. But when we started, just, just, a rat, just weird people asking perverted things. You know, asking about intimate things between husband and wife. You know, asking about divorce and remarriage and lying to me on the phone. Me catching them, catching them out in, in their lies. And, and, and you just, I could tell these people. I didn't tell straight away. You know, I'm a new pastor. I'm just trying to do the best. I think this is just normal. Until I realized these people are trying to find fault in what I have to say. And, you know, I have to be like Jesus. I have to perceive their craftiness. And what we see in this chapter are, are just little uh, red flags that you can be aware of, of people that come and ask you questions uh, because of, of their craftiness. All right? But the first thing we see is people of authority coming to ask questions. You know, instead of just being there quiet with the rest of them, listening to the teaching of Christ, 
they're coming and asking Christ questions. All right? Now, I'll just read to you a few passages. If you guys can go, keep your finger there. Turn to Proverbs chapter 21. Turn to Proverbs 21. Proverbs chapter 21. And I'll read to you from Colossians 4, 6, 4, 6, which says, Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that ye may know how ye ought to answer every man. Hey, when we answer every man, every man that comes and asks us questions, we need to make sure that when we answer, we do it by grace, we season it with salt. We're mindful with how we respond to questions, is what the Bible says. Be mindful. Hey, don't be someone with no filter whatsoever. Okay? You guys look at uh, Proverbs 21, verse 23. Proverbs 21, verse 23. The Bible says, Whoso keepeth his mouth and his tongue keepeth his soul from troubles. You know, sometimes the right answer is no answer. All right? You just keep your tongue, you stay quiet. Okay? And it'll keep you from trouble. Go to Proverbs 17. Proverbs chapter 17, verse 27. Proverbs 17, verse 27, the Bible says, He that hath knowledge, so if you, someone with knowledge, you're not stupid, right? He that hath knowledge, spareth his words. You know, you're mindful about what words you speak. You have some type of filter that will prevent you from speaking too much. And it says, and a man of understanding is of an excellent spirit. Verse 28, even a fool, when he holdeth his peace, is counted wise, and a man of understanding, sorry, uh, and he that uh, shut off his lips is esteemed a man of understanding. So look, even if you're foolish, even if you're lacking understanding, if you just stay quiet and listen, you'll be seen as someone that is counted wise when you hold your peace, okay? Even fools can get away with, with looking intelligent just by being quiet. But usually the foolish are the first to speak, you know, with, with an unfiltered mouth. But I just wanted to read these passages to you about our speech, about how we answer, that you don't, you, you know, you're mindful when someone asks you a question, and it's a bit odd, you know, you're, you're, you're kind of thinking, hold on, what is this person's motive? Why are they asking me this question? And how am I going to respond? You know, and um, this requires tact, okay, with how you speak to people. Now, when, when, I'll just um, quickly, well, we'll talk about that later on. Go back to Luke chapter 20. Go back to Luke chapter 20, verse 3, because I want to show you how Jesus responds. Does he just tell them, my authority comes from God the Father? Does he just tell them, my authority comes from heaven? He points them to the right direction, but that's not how, how he answers. Look at verse number 3. And he answered and said unto them, I will also ask you one thing, and answer me. The baptism of John, was it from heaven or of men? So we see Jesus very mindful with how he responds. He asks them a question, okay? And uh, he does that, so they're forced, because they're the ones that came with the question, they're forced to respond, and by their response, they would make known what authority Jesus uh, speaks or teaches with, okay? Because if it's from heaven, then what Jesus is saying is that, yeah, that's where my authority comes from as well, okay? So by extension, Jesus is revealing what authority he is coming from, what, what authority he is preaching from. Verse number five. And they reasoned with themselves, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say, Why then believed ye him not? Say what? So if they say John the Baptist was a prophet, with the authority of God, with the authority of heaven, Jesus will ask them, Well, why didn't you believe what he taught? And what did John the Baptist come preaching? He came preaching pointing people to the Son of God, pointing them to Jesus Christ, the Lamb that taketh away the sin of the world. He came teaching that. So if, if you're saying that John the Baptist, his authority is from heaven, then why don't you believe me? Why don't you accept my authority is what Jesus is saying. They can't answer that question like that. They're trying to find fault in Jesus. They're trying to turn the hearts of the people against Jesus. They can't say it's from heaven. Verse number six. But if we say of men... All the people will stone us, for they be persuaded that John was a prophet. So look, these people that are coming to the temple to serve God, to do the right thing, right? The things that God has commanded of them. These same people will stone us if we say the authority of John was from men. You say, why is that? You know, these religious leaders were profiting from the preaching of John the Baptist. It's John the Baptist that had, had created a new generation 
that had a heart for God, that were prepared for Jesus Christ to come. And you know, he, he, he converted these people, he was baptizing them by the thousands. These people were being made right with God. Then they go into the temple to do their temple worship. And of course, these priests, they're profiting from that, right? That the people's hearts were turned to God. They were benefiting from that. So if they say, hey, it's from man, they're like, what are you t- talking about? It's John the Baptist that, that got me saved. It's him that pointed me to Christ. It's him that told me to come to the temple, to come and do the right things before God. You know, and they'd get mad at this, right? So they're mindful, they're afraid of, of, their, of the worshippers of the temple. They're afraid of the people. So, in verse number 7, they, they answered that they could not tell whence it was. We have no authority. We, we don't know by what authority John the Baptist. They just rather remain quiet. Just as we saw in, in, in the Proverbs. You know, even a fool can stay quiet and, and appear wise, okay? So they took that advice on board from, from the book of Proverbs. But, um, you know, Jesus used tact in how he responded, you know, to reveal the truth out of the mouth of his enemies, okay? And uh, sometimes when I have somebody asking me a question that I think, I've learned this now, but, you know, it's like, that's a bit weird. What, why are you asking me that question? I normally just ask him, oh, w- what do you think? Right? Just to see where they're at, to see where their heart's at, to see if they're genuine, Okay, if they're really seeking this answer or not. And uh, look at verse number 8. And Jesus said unto them, Neither tell I you by what authority I do these things. So Jesus just undermines their position. He doesn't respect their authority. He doesn't respect them as religious. I'm not going to tell you. You've asked me. You can't answer my simple question. I'm not going to answer yours. All right. Jesus uh, put himself in a position where he didn't have to engage with time wasters. Okay, be mindful of that. Again, people ask you questions to waste your time as well. Okay, Jesus was preaching to the multitudes. He was preaching to the people in the temple. And these religious leaders are distracting him, are causing him to waste time with their nonsense questions. Verse number nine. Now, Jesus begins to speak here a parable. And this parable answers the question once again as to who sent him, as to where his authority comes from. Let's have a look at it from verse number nine. Then began he to speak to the people this parable. A certain man planted a vineyard and let it forth to husbandmen and went into a far country for a long time. So in verse number nine, this certain man represents God the Father. All right. And the husbandmen, the people that attend into the vineyard, the gardeners, if you will, these people are employees that God the Father has left to, to look after the vineyard. If you understand what we just read, really these people are these chief priests, are the Pharisees, are the Sadducees, are the scribes, are these, these elders in the temple that were rejecting Christ. Verse number 10. And at the season, he sent a servant to the husbandmen that they should give him of the fruit of the vineyard. But the husbandmen beat him and sent him away empty. And again, he sent another servant and they beat him also and entreated him shamefully and sent him away empty. And again, he sent a third, and they wounded him also and cast him out. So these servants, the, you know, represent the Old Testament prophets. The Old Testament prophets that were sent by the, the, the man who owned the vineyard. Okay? The Old Testament prophets sent by God the Father. Now, what's important about this is John the Baptist was the, the last, you might want to say Jesus, but really John the Baptist, that was the last Old Testament prophet. Okay? And remember, Jesus is comparing himself by the authority by what John the Baptist was sent and ordained by. Okay? So here we have, I'm sure Jesus is putting John the Baptist into this picture as well. Because remember, he was beheaded. Okay? He lost his life. Uh, and then uh, verse number 13. Then said the Lord of the vineyard, What shall I do? I will send my beloved son. It may be they will reverence him when they see him. All right? So in this parable, we see that Jesus as the son, as the beloved son of the man who owned the vineyard, he was already the son, all right? And I don't want to go into the eternal sonship of Christ right now, but we see even in this parable that the, 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 the man of the vineyard is sending his beloved son, meaning that he was already the son of, the, of God prior to being sent. We see that already in this parable, all right? It, and I don't need to cover that. We've already discussed that, you know, um, about it. But yeah, the eternal sonship of Christ here is being reinforced. All right. 
But God the Father thinks, if I send my son, he sees it as, if I send my son with the authority that I sent him, you know, then surely they'll reverence him. Surely they'll answer him. Verse 14, But when the husbandmen saw him, they reasoned among themselves, saying, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, that the inheritance may be ours. What wicked husbandmen. They think if we kill the heir, the man that would inherit this vineyard, if we get rid of that lineage, then we can just take over the vineyard. There's no one else here that can take, take it once that certain man passes on. There's no other um, you know, heirs to that. So they kill him. Now, Jesus Christ obviously has not been crucified as of yet. But once again, we see Jesus now prophesying of his future death, right? Being killed at the hand of the husbandman, being killed at the hands of these religious leaders, all right? Now, what's ironic about this is that they're, they're thinking they're going to kill the heir and there'll be no more heirs and they can take over the inheritance, okay? But what's ironic about this is it is the death of Christ and his resurrection by which we can become the sons of God and heirs according to the promise. Not only is there the one heir, all right, but by killing him, you know, they fulfill the prophecy, the requirement that everybody that believes on Christ can become a child of God, becomes an heir of God. So they actually multiply the amount of heirs that can take that vineyard, when, thinking that they would kill the one and they can take the vineyard for themselves. This reminds me of John 10, 1. You don't need to turn there. But it says, Jesus says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. You know, there are people that are striving to get into the kingdom of God, striving to, to be saved, like these Pharisees, like these scribes and rulers and whatever. They're seeking to be saved, they're seeking the kingdom of God, but they want to reject Christ. You know, they want to find some other way to get into that kingdom. They set themselves up, they start churches, they preach behind the pulpit. You know, you might be thinking, hey man, you know, some of these sermons they preach are good. But no, Jesus says about them that they're thieves and robbers. They're in it for themselves. They're in it to hurt the children of God. Be mindful about who you listen to. Be mindful just because they have the title pastor or doctor or whatever, reverend or whatever, you know. Make sure this person's first a believer before you start listening to them because you might be listening to a thief and robber, someone that will take advantage of you. All right, let's keep reading verse 15. So they, this is still the parable. So they cast him out of the vineyard and killed him, killed the son. What therefore shall the Lord of the vineyard do unto them? He shall come. Now Jesus asks, if the, it's a rhetorical question because Jesus answers himself. He says, he shall come and destroy these husbandmen and shall give the vineyard to others. I mean, this is in the face of, of the religious leaders. He's saying, look, if you don't receive me, God's going to kill you. God's going to destroy you. You know, we know ultimately cast into the lake of fire. And uh, look, look what it says here. And when they heard it, they said, God forbid. <laughs> All right. So when they hear this, like, what? We're going to be destroyed by God? God forbid. You know, it, it brought fear upon them. They don't want this to be true. Verse number 17. And he beheld them and said, What is this then that is written? The stone which the builders rejected, the same is become the head of the corner. Now just to explain this to you, Jesus here is talking about a cornerstone. The Bible references Christ as the, as the cornerstone. Okay, That here's the foundation. The cornerstone is, is another way of saying the foundation stone. Now today in construction... We don't really build things with stones, all right? We have bricks and, uh, you know, but in these days, you know, they would build, you know, buildings by, by, with stones, okay? And the cornerstone would be that first stone that would be laid whereby every other stone would then be placed and measured and, and, and the right angles would be built upon. That was the chief cornerstone, okay? And everything else that would be built would be based on where that chief cornerstone was placed. And if you understand this, this is talking about Jesus Christ that he is the chief cornerstone, that he is that foundation stone whereby we are to build all things. Now there in verse 17, it says, uh, what is this then that is written, the stone which the builders rejected? Okay, so Jesus would be that cornerstone that would be rejected. Now if you reject the foundation stone, what's going to happen to that building? It's 
it's going to collapse. It's not going to be built properly. It's not going to be strong. It's not going to be firm. All right? And then it says in that verse 17, The same is become the head of the corner. Whosoever shall fall upon that stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall, it shall fall, it shall grind him to powder. All right? So, look, let's understand what's being said here in verse 18. There's two scenarios. There are people that come to the stone of Christ and they stumble, okay? They, they, they break. They, they fall at it, okay? That's one group of people. Now, these people are still redeemable. They can still get up, you know, and accept that stone. All right, this is what, you know, you go and you preach the gospel of Christ. People reject it. You know, in, in, in a way, they are people that are falling on that stone, okay? You may need to preach that gospel a few times to them. I mean, you know, my wife, you know, I had to preach the gospel to her a few, a few times, maybe five or six times before she believed the gospel, okay? So she would be an example of someone that would fall out of the stone, you know? But by the sixth time, or whatever it was, she received it. She started to build her faith on that cornerstone. So that's one group of people. But if you keep falling at it and you never receive it, the second part of verse 18 is what happens to these people. But on whomsoever it shall fall, it shall grind him to pow powder. So there comes a time where you can keep stumbling, stumbling at the cornerstone. Okay, if you keep doing it, there's going to come a time where that stone itself will fall on that person and grind them to powder. It will be utterly destroyed. Obviously, that is the point where someone, you know, dies without Christ and is cast into hell. All right. Now, keep your finger there. Turn to Matthew 21, please. Matthew 21. Because I want to, I want to show you a parallel passage here in Matthew 21. Matthew 21 is, is almost identical to Luke chapter 20. But it, it's got a little bit more information here about this. It says in Matthew 21, verse 42. Matthew 21, verse 42. Jesus saith unto them, Did ye never read the Scriptures? The stone which the builders rejected, the same is become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore say I unto you, The kingdom of God shall be taken from you, and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. So those that reject the cornerstone, okay, the kingdom of God will be taken away from them. You know, these Jews, these religious leaders, they should have been the first. You know, they had the scriptures. They had the positions of authority. They should have been the first to receive Christ. They should have been the ones believing Moses so they would believe eventually on Christ. All right? But it'd be taken away from them and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. We know the nation here is a reference to the nation of Israel as a whole, okay? The nation of Israel as a whole. You know, there were certain people that rejected Christ in that nation. The majority did, but there were many that believed on Him. And then it says here in verse uh, 44, And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it shall grind him to powder. So I just wanted to show you that reference in verse 43, because that's not mentioned there in, in uh, Luke 20, but you see it, it's in the same... Uh, uh, story of the cornerstone that's talking about taking away the kingdom from those that should have received the first and it's been given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof now turn to first peter chapter 2 first peter chapter 2 let's see what this nation is what nation if not the nation of physical israel what nation then are we talking about what nation shall inherit the kingdom of god first peter chapter 2 verse 6 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 6. The Bible reads, Wherefore also it is contained in the Scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone. That's Jesus. Elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Hey, how do we receive that cornerstone? We believe on him. And the Bible's consistent. It's by faith. Verse number 7. Unto you, therefore, which believe, he is precious. But unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed or rejected, the same is made the head of the corner, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. But ye, brethren, New Life Baptist Church, this is you, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, Jesus, he's rebuking the priests, right? But he says, look, we are a royal priesthood and holy nation. All that believe on that cornerstone, 
All that believe on Christ, the Bible says, is that holy nation, is that royal priesthood. Hey, this is the nation it's been given to. It's, 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 it's a people of all nationalities. Okay, Jew, Gentile, Chilean, New Zealander. What else have we got? Korean. I don't know. What else? Um, Austrian, was it? Uh, yeah, whatever, whatever, whatever your nationality is, right? If you've believed on the cornerstone, you've received that. You are that chosen generation. You are that holy nation which has received the kingdom of God. What an honor. What an honor that God will allow us to take up that, 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 that mantle which these leaders of, of Israel had rejected. It says, A peculiar people, that ye should bring forth the praises of him that have called you out of darkness into his marvelous light which in time past were not a people, but now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. You know, Jesus, when he was in the temple, he was speaking of you and I. He was speaking of us making up that spiritual nation. The Bible also calls it the Israel of God. All right? Go back to Luke chapter 20, please, verse 19. Luke chapter 20, verse 19. People call this replacement theology if that's what they want to call it i guess that's what it is it's what the bible teaches okay that it'd be taken from the nation of israel and given to a spiritual nation all right but of course those in the nation of israel if they believe which many did then they also make up that spiritual nation they don't miss out those that believe on christ have not been replaced okay it's those that reject christ they're the ones that miss out on the kingdom let's keep reading verse 19 And the chief priests and the scribes, because obviously Jesus has offended them here, (laughs) the same hour sought to lay hands on him. They wanted to kill him right there. They wanted to take him. And they feared the people, for they perceived that he had spoken this parable against them. Yep. (laughs) They, They worked it out. Yep, this parable was against them. Okay. They're the ones that would ultimately kill the Son of God. It's amazing because Jesus is just telling them outright, you're going to kill me. (laughs) And they, and they do it. All right. They do it. Verse number 20. And they watched him and sent forth spies. Pay attention now. These these Pharisees, they they can't, they can't, uh, or chief priests and scribes, they can't uh, get their hands on Jesus because he caused an uproar. But they sent forth spies. And I truly believe these phone calls that I received the first, you know, we started this church, I believe these were spies sent by someone. If not a man, maybe the, the devil. I don't know. Okay. But sent forth spies which should feign themselves or pretend, fake themselves, just men, that they might take hold of his words, that so, uh, that so they might deliver him unto the power and authority of the governor. Hey, look, it's a possibility that we would have brethren come into this church that we think are brethren, but actually false brethren. Okay? And uh, we need to be mindful, this, is, this, is, this chapter warns us about false brethren. This chapter warns us about spies that are just trying to hear our words or trying to hear the words of the pastor to bring a false report, to bring some, you know, some, some evil to be put upon our, our, ourselves as, as children of God. You know? This is why we need to be tactful with our responses. If someone's asking a weird question, I'd question why they're asking that question. Right? Look at verse 21. These are false brethren, these, these, uh, these spies. And they asked him, what did they ask him? Saying, Master, we know that thou sayest and teachest rightly. They call him Master. They say, hey, everything you preach is right. Yeah, it's, it's spot on. Neither acceptest thou the person of any, but teachest the way of God truly. You know, what are they saying? They're flattering Jesus Christ. They're using flattery. They say, hey, we know. You know, and this is something I need to be careful of. When someone comes up to me and says, you know what, Master, <laughs> you shouldn't be calling me Master. You know, the things you preach are right. They're from God. They're awesome. You're always right. You're always 100%. You're always teaching me new things that I hadn't seen again in the Bible. And they heap praise. They heap flattery on the preacher. You know, this is, this is a telltale sign you're dealing with a spy. You're dealing with false brethren. Okay? Now, that's not to say that you can't ever say, hey, that was a nice sermon. I got something out of that. You know, but don't overdo it. Okay? You know these people don't believe on Christ. You know, they're calling him master, saying everything, man, such great preaching. You know, it's all right. We know you're teaching the way of God truly. It's perfect. It's, you never make a mistake, Jesus. These false brethren love using flattery. Now, uh, I'll get you to turn to Psalms. Again, keep your finger there in Luke. 
be careful of flattery. You know, there's been a lot of preaching on the internet about flattery lately. You know, it's, it's sort of relevant that we, we come to a passage here where we see it. But uh, go to Psalm 5, please. Psalm 5, verse 9. Psalm 5, verse 9. Psalm 5, verse 9. For there is no faithfulness in their mouth. Their inward part is very wickedness. Their throat is an open sepulcher. They flatter with their tongue. Hey, that's where flattery comes from. From those that are very wickedness. They have very wickedness. They're very wicked. Their throat is an open sepulcher. Hey, they speak dead things. They don't truly say what they mean. Okay? There is no faithfulness in their mouth. Go to Psalm 12, verse 2. Psalm 12, verse 2. Psalm 12, verse 2. The Bible reads, They speak vanity, everyone with his neighbor. With flattering lips and with a t- double heart do they speak. Hey, those with the flattering lips, they've got a double heart. Okay, you think their heart is one way, but really it is another way. Okay, they speak vanity, they waste time, it's empty, it's useless. You know, have some tact about you. You know, perceive people that are trying to fool you, that are trying to flatter you. It's very hard because the flesh likes flattery. You know, the flesh likes to be praised, you know. And this is why, you know, anyone that preaches here, you need to always remind yourself, I'm coming in humility. I'm preaching as a servant. I'm feeding the people of God. You know, don't make yourself more than what you really are. You you really are just a man, okay? And that'll prevent you from enjoying the flattery that comes your way, okay? Because it's not about you. It's about feeding the brethren. It's about doing the work of God. Back to Luke 20, please. Verse 22. Luke 20, verse 22. What's the question these flatterers, these spies, ask Jesus? Is it lawful for us to give tribute unto Caesar or no? You know, is it, is it according to the law of Moses that we can actually we should pay taxes to Caesar? Does the law of Moses say we should pay taxes to Caesar? Think about that question for a minute. <laughs> It is such a stupid question. Of course, the law of Moses, when they say lawfully, they're talking about the law of Moses, they're talking about the Old Testament law. Of course, God does not say there to pay taxes to Caesar. Of course, right? I mean, they're to be a sovereign nation under God, Israel, okay? And uh, they're asking such a stupid question. And honestly, I get people ask me stupid questions all the time. I'm not saying you guys, I'm just saying, if people ask me like phone calls or emails, it's like, why are you even asking? I haven't even realized that's a question you can ask. All right? Of course, look, God was, it's not his intention that the, the Roman Empire would have, you know, um, taken over Israel and other parts of this world. That was never, you know, it was always God's intention that Israel would be that sovereign nation under God. So it's not going to write about giving taxes to Caesar. Okay? But if Jesus says, no, the law of Moses never says that, then they can accuse him of saying they shouldn't pay the taxes. They can accuse him and report him to the, to the authorities of Rome and get him arrested or whatever, you know, as a troublemaker. How does Jesus respond? Verse 23. But he perceived their craftiness. There it is. That's the title of the sermon. He perceived their craftiness and said unto them, Why tempt ye me? Why are you doing this? Verse 24. Show me a penny. Whose image and superscription hath it? They answered and said, Caesar's. And he said unto them, Render therefore unto Caesar the things which be Caesar's, and unto God the things which be God's. It's an awesome response. Jesus is saying, look, who cares about money? You know, serving God is more than your money. If it's got Caesar's face, just give it to Caesar if he wants it. If that's what's required of you. Okay, we are to respect the authority that God puts. God has instituted government as it will. Okay, we know that the government, you know, we live in a, we live in a nation where we have a decent government, I suppose. But still, it's wicked. Still, it's got their, their hearts against people. But it's not as, I guess, as corrupt or wicked as some other nations, you know. It's still corrupt, though. It's, it's pretty corrupt. But still, look, if, if, if the government requires you to pay your taxes, then just pay it, okay? But he says, uh, and unto God the things which be God's. So give him the money. But give your life, the things that belong to God, the greater things. Give it to God. Don't give it to, to government, okay? It's such a, it's a, a great response because he respects the authority of the Roman Empire there, you know? But he also highlights what's much more important than the government. You know, that's serving God, giving to God what belongs to God. Verse 26, And they could not take hold of his words before the people, and they marveled at his answer and held their peace. And they're like, oh man, he's really, you know, he's really um, given a good answer here. We can't really, we can't find fault in him. They just stay quiet, okay? They hold their peace. 
So they hold their peace, these, these uh, spies. But now, another group of people come to Jesus to find fault in him. Verse 27, Then came to him certain of the Sadducees. Now, I don't know much about the Sadducees. I don't really know what they... I think you can sort of look it up on the internet, find out what they believed. Uh, but what, we get a little bit of what they believed here in verse 27. Then came to him certain of the Sadducees, which deny that there is any resurrection, and they asked him. So the Sadducees are a sect of the, of, of the Jewish religion, I suppose, back then. I've heard that they were very uh, liberal in their views, and it would make sense that they were liberal if they, did, if they denied a resurrection. So they don't believe, they believe there's a life now, and that's, that's the life you need to live. There's no future resurrection to come. So I think if you had that mindset, if you just believe I'm going to die, like when I die, that's the end of it, I guess you would be liberal. I guess you just live it up and, and, and you know, whatever. So I, I guess that makes sense. I mean, it's such a weird thing that they, they would uh, deny the resurrection. And they asked him, what, what do they ask him? Verse 28. And again, guys, when you read this, don't worry about the question too much, but just think about who's asking this question. It's people that do not believe in the resurrection. Verse 28, saying, Master, Moses wrote unto us, if any man's brother die, having a wife, and he die without children, and his brother should take his wife and raise up seed unto his brother. There were therefore seven brethren, and the first took a wife and died without children. The second took her as wife, and he died childless. And the third took her, and in like manner the seven also, and they left no children and died. <laughs> I mean, just think of how stupid. It should already make you go, man, it's so stupid. Now, how real is this question that seven brethren would take a, a, the same woman over and over and over again? They'll just die before they can have any children. Verse 32. Last of all, the, women, the woman died also. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife of them is she? For seven had her to wife. Now, that should, should tell you immediately. Why are they asking Jesus a, uh, you know, a, a, a stupid question about a resurrection that they don't even believe in? Are they seeking a true answer from Jesus? Of course not. They don't even believe the resurrection. What kind of nonsense is this question? And that's another stupid question, an unlikely question. Verse 34, And Jesus answering said unto them, So even though it's a stupid question, I guess at this point Jesus sees the need to answer it. You know, and He answers it pretty black and white this time. Okay, But I just want to see every question that comes to Jesus he measures her, measures her up. How am I going to answer this? This time he feels, yeah, I'm just going to answer this one straight out. And it, it's good that he does because he puts them into their place. Jesus answering said unto them, the children of this world marry and are given in marriage. All right, so children of this world, you know, till death do us part. You know, in this world we ought to marry, given to marriage. All right. And then verse 35, but they which, now notice this, but they which shall be accounted worthy to obtain that world, and the resurrection of the dead, neither marry nor are given in marriage. So it says, look, in the world to come, as it were, you know, eternal life, salvation, um, those that are resurrected from the dead, those that are accounted worthy, neither marry nor are given in marriage. So just a, a quick doctrine there. Once you get into heaven, there's no more marriage. All right? You know, the Islamists believe they'll get seven. What is that if they, if they kill themselves? I mean, you might know this. Is it seven virgins? Or 70. 70 virgins they'll get. To marry, okay? If there are, you know, if, if Allah counts them worthy. You know, but even the, uh, not, not that different, the Mormons. The Mormons believe when you get married, you have an eternal marriage. It goes into the resurrection. It goes into forever, eternity. And, you know, they can have many wives as well, they believe. It's very similar. But Jesus says, look, once, you know, once we, we're in eternity, there's no more marriage. So let me just say to those that are married, appreciate the marriage that you have today. It's the only one you're going to get. Right? In eternity, it's not going to be that. I mean, eternity is going to be even better. Okay? But you're not going to have the marriage. Enjoy what you have today. It's a special thing that God gives to the, to the children of this world. Okay? But uh, verse number 37. So what I wanted to show you there is that those that are resurrected, Jesus says they're accounted worthy. So the, the Sadducees don't believe in the resurrection. What is Jesus saying about them? They're not worthy. They're not accounted worthy. He's not just answering the question. He's putting them down. Okay, he's, he's, he's criticizing them. Verse 37. Now that the dead are raised, even Moses showed at the bush when he called the Lord of God, sorry, the, the Lord, the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob, for he is not a God of the dead, but of the living, for all live unto him. 
Now, just to show you this, I thought this was interesting. Just keep your finger there. Turn to Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3. Let's just have a look at the passage that Jesus is referring to here. Exodus chapter 3, verse 6. Exodus chapter 3, verse 6. Give you a moment to turn there. So this is God speaking to Moses. Um, and he says here in, in verse number 6, Exodus 3, 6. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. But notice how God answers or responds to Moses there. He says, I am the God of thy father. He doesn't say, I was the God of your father. I was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. No, I am the God. Hey, I'm still their God today. They're still living today because they put their faith on him. You know, they're, they're rejoicing in heaven. And so, you know what? Even when we pass away, he's still our God. You know, our, our, our brethren, our, our loved ones that have believed on Christ that are no longer with us. It, the, the God that we worship is still the same God. They're still living today as far as God is concerned. Okay, the resurrection is something that is real. Go back to uh, Luke 20, please, verse 39. So I thought it was just a bit clearer there in Exodus 3, 6, how, we, how, how God responds there than what we just read there. But look at verse number 39 now, Luke 20, verse 39. I'm not sure if I read th verse 38. I'll just read it quickly. For he is not, a, I did read it. For he is not a God of the dead, but of the living, and all live unto him. So again, just what's he saying to the Sadducees? You're dead. Because God is a God of the living. All right? They're currently spiritually dead. Okay? That's that. So when you understand how Jesus responds, he doesn't just give the answer. He's also showing the error of their ways. And that's why we get to verse 39, because now we have another group of people come up to Jesus. All right? And it says, Then certain of the scribes answered and said, Master, thou hast well said. Because right? the scribes, obviously, here they believe in the resurrection. I'm sure they're having their, their theological debates with the Sadducees about the resurrection. And they're like, Jesus, yeah, you're right. You know, there is a resurrection. All right. Uh, so they're delighted that Jesus had shown the error of the ways of the Sadducees. But you know what? Even these scribes don't get away from the rebuke of Jesus Christ. <laughs> it would have been just better if they just stayed quiet. But, they, you know, they say, yeah, Master, you said well. But verse 40. Uh, and after that, they durst not ask him any question at all. And he said unto them, unto who? The scribes that just said, you know, Master, that has well said. He said unto them, how say they that Christ is David's son? All right, so go back to Luke 18 very quickly. Luke 18, verse 38. Luke 18, verse 38. So we see this acknowledgement by everybody there that Christ, the Messiah, remember that they don't think it's Jesus. You know, they know, they know Messiah is coming, but they don't think it's Jesus. But there's an acknowledgement here that the Messiah is David's son, all right? Now, remember back in Luke 18, we had the story of a, the blind man. Now, in the book of Matthew, it records it as two blind men, but in the book of Luke, they only focus on the one blind man. And remember when he, what he said to Jesus here in Luke 18, verse 38, Luke 18, verse 38, it says, And he cried, saying, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And I had told you, see, when, he, when he's called there the son of David, he was acknowledging there that the, the son of David was the Messiah. He was acknowledging there that that was the one that would, uh, uh, you know, have an eternal kingdom to come. Okay, so I just wanted to show you that. Go back to Luke 20. So there was, in this time, people knew the Messiah, the one to come, would be the son of David. All right? Now, let's look at verse 42. Luke 20, 42. And David himself saith in the book of Psalms, The Lord, okay, so God, the Lord, said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, till I make thine enemies thy footstool. David therefore calleth him Lord. How is he then his son? All right, what's that about? All right, so this psalm is about David's son, okay? But what does he say about the son? He says, The Lord said unto my Lord. So David is calling his own son, whoever that one is, as his Lord as well. All right? Of course, this is Jesus Christ. This is God the Father calling Jesus Christ, you know, Lord as well. Okay? Sit thou on my right hand. And so 
David sums up the question there in verse number 41. How say, how say they that Christ is David's son? It's David's son in the flesh. Okay? When Jesus Christ was born, he came down the lineage, down to the descendancy of, uh, of, uh, of David. Okay? But before he became the son of David, as it were, in the flesh, he was already the Lord of David. Okay? He was already the Lord God. And this is important because this ties in right at the beginning, the question, by what authority do you te teach these things? By what authority? He's God. He's the Lord of David. All right. So he's answering, not directly, but indirectly, the very first question that came his way. You know? And if that didn't make sense to you, please ask me. But the son of David was known to be the Messiah. Jesus Christ. Christ means Messiah. You know, we're acknowledging that, David is the, uh, that Jesus is the Messiah. We're acknowledging that Jesus is the son of David. We acknowledge that he's the Lord of David, that he's the Lord of Lords. You know, that he is God, not just the son of man, not just the son of God, but that he is God himself. Let's keep reading verse 45. Am I up to verse 45? Yep. Then in the audience of all the people, he said unto his disciples, Beware of the scribes. So it would be better if the scribes just said nothing. Right? He goes, look, beware of the scribes, which desire to walk in long robes, and love greetings in the markets, and the highest seats in the synagogues, and the chief rooms at feasts, which devour widows' houses, and for a show make long prayers, the same shall receive greater damnation. So these scribes love to go along, uh, walk around with their long robes. I mean, isn't that just a Roman Catholic church in a nutshell right there, with their long robes? I mean, even, even the Anglicans, I've seen, not always, but many times they do put on that, that dress, that long, you know, and they, they should, that really, it's so ugly. Why would you wear that? It's so disgusting, all these long robes. But it, it makes them feel holy, it makes them feel important by putting that on. You know, don't go any, near any religious leader that's wearing a long robe. Just avoid them altogether. Jesus already warned us of them. They love the greetings in the markets. They love, they, they, they seek to be acknowledged. They want to be known by all people. It says, and the highest seats in the synagogues. You know, they want to be seated in the places of prominence. You know, to be seen as people high and above others. And the chief room of the feasts. But really, what do they do in verse 47? It says, which devour widows' houses. They don't care for the people. Okay, they take advantage of whoever they can. You know, the widows are the ones that need, that have a need the most. You know, they don't have a man in their life. Maybe they come to these people seeking some guidance. Instead, they devour the widows' houses. They take, it, they take the possessions that belong to others. And, make, and for a show, make long prayers. The same shall receive greater damnation. Hey, they're leading others away from Christ. The reason they get the greater damnation, they turn the hearts of the people away from the truth, the way, the truth, and the life being Jesus Christ. Hey, I mean, the greater damnation. And, uh, yeah, that's the end of this chapter. But I, I hope you realize now, when you answer people, be careful. I'm not saying amongst the brethren we have a chit-chat and we have a general discussion, we ask questions and all those kind of things. I'm not talking about that. I'm just talking about the flatterer, the spies, the people you may not know very well that ring you up asking you questions or emails or, you know, text message you on social media. You know, they'll copy those messages and they'll, they'll do with, with whatever they can with it, you know. Be, be careful about how you answer people. Even Jesus, you know, time and time again we saw in this chapter, people coming to him. And Jesus was very mindful how to answer, you know. And uh, praise God that Jesus has given us this example. And uh, I'll, just, I'll just finish with this, um, just on the topic of, of responding with tact. Um, I don't know, if, did I write down the definition here? Let me just check my notes, because I don't want to mess it up. I don't generally look at my notes too much when I preach, so I might not have even written it. But with tact, the way you answer... Some people have a mis misconception of what tact means. Tact, tact means just you, you respond tactfully. You're mindful about what, how your words might be perceived or conveyed. Now, there are people that use tact that are wicked people. And that they use it to deceive. They say half-truths, okay, in order for people to come away with one understanding when really that person meant something else. Obviously, that's not the way we should be, okay? With tact, all I'm saying is we should make sure that our speech is seasoned with salt, that there's grace, that we're also thinking about the person we're responding to, okay? How can I get the message across them where they can't misrepresent what I'm saying, where they can't take my words and use it against me? That's, that was Jesus Christ. So, you know, we should be similar as well.
Let's pray.